Hey there. Hey, Corey. How are you doing? Hey, good day, Eric. I'm good. How are you? All right. So here we are with another episode of our little show we call Crime and Politics. See, there it is. Crime and Politics. Welcome, welcome. you're wondering. Yeah. And uh, I'll read a little tagline here. I, I, I wrote this tag thing, so I, I probably should read it out. Crime and Politics, a show about the intersection of criminal justice and political corruption and the systemic solutions we need with Eric and Corey. So here we are. Now, this episode... Yeah, what are we talking about today? What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about squelched. Squelched? Yeah. What is squelched, right? Like on a radio? (laughs) Oh, funny (laughs) you should say that. (laughs) There it is. Hey. Yeah, so um, I think like a squelch is there's like this squelch knob that you see on old walkie-talkies and and other radios, like CB radios and things. And the, the purpose of the squelch knob was that if you didn't have it, if you didn't have any squelch function, you would be hearing a lot of noise on, on your CB or your walkie-talkies. You know, like all the kids use these days, their CBs and, and their talkies. Only the cool kids. <laughs> <laughs> but you would hear this uh, all the time. And so what the squelch does is it kind of it, it silences that if there's nothing there to hear. But if someone's actually broadcasting where you, you do want to hear them, then it allows that part through. And so it's good because... Um, you don't get all that noise, but you hear who you want to hear. The problem comes if you take that little squelch knob and turn it up too high. Like if you really crank it, you're not going to hear anything. If you, you know, put it halfway in between where, you know, but higher than it should be, then you're going to get like, you'll hear, you might hear like strong, loud signals, but you'll be, uh, but you might be missing some of the, some of the softer things. And so, you know, squelching is, is about balance and, you know, only squelching down the noise. It's yeah. Supposed to be. yeah, yeah, definitely. They're always kind of doing this like little balance where they're trying to get it just right, where you have none of the independent media voices, but you <laughs> can still get your CNN. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect squelching, which it's the perfect squelching for them. Yeah, <laughs> for the establishment. For the establishment, which brings us into uh, what our topic. Basically, the squelching is a synonym for censorship. Which is, you know, the topic of today's show. Let me clear this one off. There we go. All right. So we're talking about censorship. So the big question, censorship, good or bad? I'm going to say bad. I'm going to have to agree with you there. Censorship, bad. Oh. All right. I guess we solved that one, right? Yeah, that's it. All right. (laughs) (laughs) No, we've got more. We've got more. Um, So one of the things that I've been, you know, wanting to say about this is that at this point, if, if you're if you're any kind of lefty, you're really if you're not like like a, a an authoritarian goon. You, you should be howling about censorship. At this point. You should be it should be what you're talking about, what you're complaining about. It should be it's just unacceptable what's what's happening. And, and censorship is, is wrecking any kind of movement, any kind of left movement, any kind of movement towards real justice and equality. It's really, it's wrecking out just even a chance to have an open civilized society. Yeah, you should be angry about this. Um, you, 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 you do you do not have a, a free and progressive society with, with this level of censorship. I mean, if you look at any kind of authoritarian regime of, of history, uh, book burning, um, you know, censorship of authors and people, uh, it's just not any kind of way to have a, a progressive society. And what I like to say is that, you know, they're, they're going to censor us all is what's is what's basically where we're headed towards. And speaking of being censored, puts us into a topic we should always be discussing is Julian Assange, who's being not only censored, but just downright disappeared. Um, For what? For the crime of journalism. I think back with with Wikipedia, when it it first came on the scene, um, the thing that they really made their splash for was the collateral murder video and that was you know gun sight video from our military our apache helicopters murdering civilians uh, and they just wiped them out and then when the first responders came to help the people that that they shot up they killed them as well this was you know a shocking video this, this you should have had resignations you should have had people in jail you should have had hearings and instead you know, who's the person in jail? Who's the person persecuted and prosecuted is the, the whistleblower, the person who, 
who put it out there, Assange. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, even the, the, the grounds that they're holding him on is, 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 you know, pretty, pretty weak. I mean, as a matter of fact, if he were on American soil, it, it would indeed be cruel and unusual punishment. He's not on American soil, though. And, you know, maybe that's, that's for, that's for a purpose. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the, one of the, the points they made in the, in the case, uh, when they were delaying his extradition was basically making the argument that the United States was too brutal of a country to extradite to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that our prisons were would be so much that he 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 commit suicide or just or just die from the from the punishment. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, th- this this is a this is an educated uh, man that that at you know prior to this was was connected and had uh, you know was doing journalism and and so you know he himself is is a is a public figure of sorts. And so imagine what they would do to somebody that that wasn't that that wasn't a public figure. You went from from Trump to Biden. And it was supposed to be that this big improvement, <laughs> and and you know we, we, we had kind of the, this maybe fleeting hope that that Biden's Justice Department would would drop the charges and just and let it go, and yeah the the, the deep state the the CIA and these these agencies they hate Assange one one of the one of the things I've heard one of the real reasons why they, they hate him so much is what is it the vault. It's the vault something releases, but where they, they keep it, where they where WikiLeaks released a whole bunch of information on like these hacking tools and these things about about the the tools and the hacks and the software that 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 they used and and exposing that stuff, and that's what the deep state gets real excited about. <laughs> yeah. And, Definitely, and and, I, and and on Assange, that man is is a threat to nobody, uh, and he's treated like Hannibal Lecter, and and denied even the voice to, to respond to, to accusations. Yeah, it's really sad to to not be able to hear his voice at all. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, you can just imagine what he'd be saying. At this point, they've they've crushed him so much. At this point, he's he's a, he's a pretty broken man, but uh, but I'm, I'm you know. I, I hope that we do see the day that he's, that he's freed. He needs to be released. He needs to be healed. He needs to be listened to. And, you know, what they do to Assange, they, they do to us all. Absolutely. Yeah, so at this point, you know, the, the, censor, the censorship just in general is just really off, off the charts. And the big example that we just had recently was um, RT. And just RT, just RT America, just being wiped out, just disappeared, like Assange was. Um, and <clears throat> he had a, lot, a whole lot of left voices on on RT America, on RT. Um, we can't, you know, we um, we like, and they, you know, like he says here, is redacted Tonight Show, brought you anti-war, anti anti corporate comedy every week for eight years and they just, they just wipe it out and wipe out the archive and it just disappeared yeah definitely i mean that's you know obviously with the with the putin boogie manning and the russia gating that's that's going on uh it's 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 leading to a lot of this this censorship and this squelching uh you know it's it's it definitely shows um how we treat um, things differently, uh, and it'd be exactly the same as, as saying the BBC is, is British government propaganda, um, or PBS. Yeah, and uh, and all what you're really having here is is just that squelching of, of of a lot of voices, uh, people on different sides, but especially the, these lefties that we're talking about. But uh, that that falls into that that whole um, that whole censorship empire that's going on. And then also removed um, from RT was Chris Hedges. He was just a legendary Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Yeah, definitely one of, one of the best journalists of our of our time, really. And so he's moved to Substack because you know RT's gone. Um, so definitely, you know, recommend you know checking out his sub, sub Substack and supporting it. And one of his first articles here is on disappeared. He talks about how. His whole archive of shows that, that were on YouTube six years worth were just wiped out, just gone. I hit the delete button, you know. And why? Because Russia, Putin, bad. He talks about on here. Um, um, his whole archive was 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 removed, and you know the, these are these are highbrow like philosophy shows about philosophy and books, 
a show about a book about George Washington, another one biography of Oppenheimer, um, Susan Sontag. Uh, he's got interviews with Cornell West, um, Noam Chomsky, you know, discussions with Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi. Um, yeah, this is a serious guy with the, with the credentials to prove, and it's it's you know similar to uh, talking about Assange when you're dealing with journalists is that you know the, these they they have no limit to who they will censor in the name of of whatever boogeyman or, or whatever story they're trying to squelch. And just reading from Chris's article, he says, "I received no inquiry or notice from YouTube. I vanished." In totalitarian, in totalitarian systems, you exist and then you don't. I suppose this was done in the name of censoring Russian propaganda, although I have a hard time seeing how a, de- a detailed discussion of Ulysses or the biographies of Susan Sontag and J. Robert Oppenheimer have any connection in the eyes of even the most obtuse censors in Silicon Valley with Vladimir Putin. Indeed, there's not one show that dealt with Russia. I was on RT because, as a critic of U.S. imperialism, militarism, the corporate control of the two ruling parties, and especially because I support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel, because of all that, I was blacklisted. Yeah, and so um, what you really have here is uh, arbitrary, and similar to to Assange, arbitrary, and in, um, in the best interests of the moneyed interests i think i've heard the terminology arbitrary and capricious yeah that's good (laughs) against all of us unless well if you're a billionaire you'll probably be in favor of this caleb moppin another very important voice on the left who in this way it's, it's kind of a soft censoring and it's not um it's not so much that they took down his account but they add this nice helpful little tag you know, Russian state affiliated media, which I find funny because he doesn't have a blue check mark, but he does have Russia state affiliated media. You made it, Caleb. He made it. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the big jokes about it is is that his his connection with RT is now severed because they got rid of RT, right? And they squashed that. So. How is he even affiliated anymore? Uh, maybe if he, <laughs> he has a little tag on the back of his neck that says "Made in Russia." <laughs> And, you know, and he says here, my personal Twitter account is not state-affiliated media. Nobody at RT or Russia tells me what to tweet on this account. This is an attempt to discredit discredit me and prevent people from hearing an anti-imperialist message. Shame on you, Twitter. And the anti-imperialist is, is a big part of this. You know, that's really who you see being censored. Nobody wants to talk about the fall of Rome. <laughs> and one of the things that... You, I've heard from several people who are on t- who are on RT and had shows on there was that um, they really felt a, a, a lot more editorial freedom on RT than than they did on on US networks and, and other networks and other places. Um, to a person, they've said that they wrote their own shows, their own material. No one told them what to say or what not to say, and they would really contrast that to to things like U.S. corporate meth, um, U.S. corporate networks where things are, are very scripted and very locked down. Yeah, I don't think that's to say that, that how you know uniquely amazing Russia's uh, media is, but just how far bad the U.S. media has gotten. Mm. And you, you had other people on the network like Tara Reid, uh, Jesse Ventura, a very popular show there, um, the late, great Ed Schultz. Yeah, rest in peace. He, came, know, over, he came over to RT America when MSNBC shut him down. Because, you know, you talk too much about unions and working people. Yeah. Like old Ed Schultz said, let's get to work. Let's get to work. <laughs> now, the, the, the censorship regime, you know, sometimes I think of it as, as kind of this Frankenstein monster that that I think even the people who, who started it up and push it, you know, really aren't necessarily in control of it. It, it, it becomes it becomes this, this mob mentality where it's... Um, where it, it can target anyone in almost almost anything. You saw, um, like New York Times editors being uh, being fired over over kind of a mob mob mentality. You, you have a certain. I can get into some a little bit of trouble here, but you you have a certain type of of young PMC class type of, of person who who feels that that the world. The world should really conform to them, and it, yeah. if it's anything that discomforts them, 
is something that they should be allowed to just get rid of. Right. And it's also the kind of person that um, really, really likes to get outraged and really, really <laughs> likes to likes to, to, to get that um, – like in their mind, it's that like justice um, adrenaline hit where they're 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 taking down the thing that they're outraged about, and it becomes very tribal in that way. And so, in terms of kind of the, the Frankenstein monster, you know, aspect of this, you had um, the show arising on the hill. You know, and the hill is is a, a very corporate, you know, really kind of a right wing newspaper and you know, and corporate network. But even they they got dinged because they they did a segment that that had a short. Um, bit of video from Donald Trump saying, you know, the things he says about the election, and because they didn't put it in proper context, um, that episode actually that episode was squashed, and the whole channel was suspended for a week. And so, how are people uh, going to expect uh, good and unbiased journalism uh, when there are so many of these barriers in, in the way? And so. With the with the Russia Ukraine conflict, we've seen um, you know, the, the terms of service being updated at YouTube. It seems almost on a daily basis, uh, basically in, in whatever way you know suits them to do what they want to censor at that point or what they're they're hearing from. Um, and so you know you, you had this one from a little while back saying, you know, uh, the now their their guidelines prohibit denying, minimizing, or trivializing well-documented violent events i mean can that be any more broad it's <laughs> yeah that's uh really subjective I, I don't i don't know who is making those judgment calls on what is uh trivializing but that's that's definitely um it's definitely arbitrary <laughs> and it's this thing where um they're they're not only doing it but they're they're bragging about it i mean censorship used to be a thing that would only be done as, as a last resort. It'd be like something that, you know, oh, well, I guess we, we have to. And now, they're, like they're saying here, since our last update, our teams have removed more than a thousand channels and 15,000 videos for violating not only our hate speech policy, but also our policies around misinformation, graphic content, and more. And it's like it's like they're it's like they're they're trying to sell you something here. It's they're bragging about it. Yeah, and it speaks it speaks also to to the what's happening with that that sort of group that you were talking about before is very very vocal uh, group with with money and, and influence and power and, and impressive job titles that um, is pushing for this and is cheering on, cheering it on. You know. And so there, there's this question of of what are people supposed to do. You know, and you'll get arguments like that. You know, oh, they're a private co corporation. You don't, you don't have to use them. And it's like, so you're going to go broadcast on the other YouTube. I mean, it's, you know, yes, they're competitors and they're rising, like like Rockman and Rumble and Odyssey. And I, I hope they become real competitors. But at this point, if if you're a content creator, you you can't ignore YouTube. You can't just just not be on it if you're already established. Like Glenn, Glenn Greenwald has managed to do this on Rumble, and I'd, I'd recommend anyone to check out what he's doing. And um, you know, and I think Jimmy Dore has expanded onto Rumble and, and gets good views there. And, and I hope it, it becomes something where it's not just YouTube, but it's um, you know that that's that, this excuse. You know, any anybody who says you know, oh, well, they're they're private business, so they can just do the terms of censorship and they, they can just show or not anyone you want. I mean, it, that's, it, it's not a serious argument <laughs> Yeah, what's not, going on here. It's underestimating the power that YouTube does have in, in the general discourse. Um, you know, I've heard that, that as, as, as many as one, one third of people in the world uh, have, have at one point or another made a YouTube account, which would make it the most used social media platform. It's a place where people uh, go for just about anything. I mean, if we just think about, oh, I need to make a repair on something in the house, you know, what do you do? You look on a YouTube video. It is really so important and really has um, almost like taken over the, the media of television in itself and so there's this idea that sometimes you know we might be able to treat it as a public utility um and, and doing that but yeah it's, it's it's a really important thing or really it's something that people should get riled up about is is the the amount of censorship on what essentially is the the global meeting space of youtube the new public square yeah and you know you, you see it in other platforms um there was recently a big round of censorship on discord which is a popular one among among gamers, but also among a lot of, of lefty type streamers, um, and they form you know communities on there, and they just at one point 
whoever runs Discord just decided they didn't like one of the channels on there and what they were saying. And they deleted that channel and they also permanently deleted the account of two of the admins on that channel. And these admins also help out a lot of other lefty channels. And it was it was ridiculous. But, you know, they, they just um, they own the company and they make the rules. Yeah, I mean, there's there's really, as we were getting to, the, there's no limit at the amount of voices that they will shut down. And so there's this idea of like, where you're, where you, you know, is there other places to go? So, you know, we all know the problems with, with Google and Google search. And so we might we tend to go to DuckDuckGo. I, I tend to use DuckDuckGo over, over Google. And then in, well, in one fell swoop recently, you know, DuckDuckGo managed to trash their whole reason for existing. <laughs> and this is the, you know, the guy who runs it, Gabriel Weinberg saying, um, you know, like so many others, sickened by Russia and Russia's invasion, and at, at DuckDuckGo, we've been rolling out search updates that downrank sites associated with Russian disinformation. Wow! You know, and what does that even mean? And you know, you you have the, the 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 problem with censorship that you always have is that who makes a decision? Who who decides what's dis, what's disinformation? What gets to stay or go? I mean, there's also this this thing too that that when it gets into you know the, they're they're basically making like censorship algorithms too, of, of which also those those algorithms are sometimes getting back to that the thing where it's like poorly controlled. And so I assume that's what DuckDuckGo is doing. They must be having some sort of thing where that they're reading keywords off of websites and downvoting them in the search engine. And uh, you know that's just sort of, that's a really just a dangerous precedent here. Is precedents getting setting that uh, set rather that are that are troubling. And it gets into algori- algorithmic suppression and shadow banning. And you have the, these soft forms of censorship that in some ways are more insidious and dangerous than, than just outright disappearing things. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, we need to also think about, um, you know, people that, that talked about, um, you know, Iraq and the WMDs and, and a lot of these things that have happened over the years. If they had said that at that time, they would have been censored down. Now, now we would realize and, and recognize that they were onto something. MLK, Malcolm X, all these voices would have been censored during their time. Um, and so that's just something to keep in, in mind in context, even if even if you are somebody that that is questioning about, you know, the things of censoring and if there's a reason for it, just just, you know, for, for a second, just think about that, that thing and that the people that we now look back as heroes or whistleblowers, they would have been censored in their time, too. So one of the journalists that that writes about this a lot, that, that talks about this a lot that I really respect is, is Matt Taibbi. And he has a really good series. I'd recommend um, subscribing to his Substack. He he writes about these issues a lot. He has a series called uh, Meet the Censored, where he highlights people who have been censored in in various ways. One of the things I heard him say about it at one point is that um, as far as whether he's highlighting people that are like would be considered left wing or or right wing, he. He said that, that he, he could find plenty of both examples and he could be highlighting people on, on the right who are being censored on a regular basis. But he says he actually has gone out of his way to, to highlight people more on the left who are being censored because the people on the left are the ones that are supposed to be upset about this. It's supposed to be a value to the LC, ALCU types. Right. And so, you know, the censorship always comes back onto the left. I mean, that's the, the, the left-wing voices are the ones who are really against power, against imperialism, against you know, corporate control. And, the, you know, they're the ones who are really going to end up censored. Um, but among his examples, I'll bring this up, of uh, Meet the Censored, was Sherry DeVille. And, um, and she, you know, runs a site that, you know, is making use of her assets it's not bad on the eyes, <laughs> and um, and you know what this one gets into is, is censorship that gets into like payment processors, and how I mean I remember back in the day when WikiLeaks when all WikiLeaks first came on the scene, the payment processors shut down payments to WikiLeaks, and they just they just did it PayPal, Mastercard, Visa they just decided WikiLeaks was bad and and they made it very difficult to, to continue to give donations to them. Yeah, I forgot about that. I remember that now. I think mm-hmm. you're like pretty much it was like crypto that you had to, to use. I mean they managed to set up other processors overseas. Oh yeah. And and you know and of course they survived and whatnot. But that just kind of happened 
and everybody was just you know it, it didn't seem to be very much of a stink <laughs> yeah so now this story gets into um visa and mastercard you know imposing new rules as they they say to stamp out illegal activity in pornography sites and you know as sherry deville talks and she's actually very well spoken not that that should be surprising i mean that's um there's no reason she wouldn't be but uh and and she she talks about how it, it's it's not even it's not even just the straight up you know that you can't have pornography or something like she she talks about you know as she puts here like you know, women are allowed to squirt but we're not allowed to urinate <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we can't insert our panties anymore because um, that's an object. So that's like the rules. Like you can't, you know, they can't insert objects in, into their orifices. But um, so if it's a carrot shaped dildo, that's a no, no. But if it's a phallic shaped dildo, that's apparently OK because it's not considered uh, a foreign object. <laughs> and it's, it's got a rules that that just. Yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> That's that, for sure. That just gets into it. And um, and she has a good, good quote here. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, oh, here we go. I highlighted it. Help highlight it for your, to be helpful. All right. Um, the general public, so this is uh, quoting from Sherry DeVille. The general public should freak out that MasterCard now controls what they can and cannot watch. Today they're regulate, regulating porn, but what if they start deciding what cinema and books we consume? Because, you know, there's just a heck of a lot of control there with the payment processors. That actually really surprised me. I, I thought that there would be, with financial services, some kind of regulation that you find it's not up to financial services to, to decide what people are buying with it. But I, that's 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 news to me. I mean, yeah, that's obviously very troubling. I mean, you, you know, you have those companies, too, that they, they run all these infrastructures of, of payment processing. And, and they can essentially just, um, you know, freeze your bank accounts. And, and that, that amount of power that they have there is, 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 is scary. It should be scary. Yeah, and you can get into things like social credit systems and really just increasing <clears throat> that whole that whole power and and you know you can end up with this system where if you get on the wrong side of the establishment of, of the narrative, you know, not only can you be censored and blocked from social media, but it gets to the point where you could be blocked from your bank accounts. Yeah. And, and basically pushed out of society. Essentially, yeah, um, and um, that that's 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 that sh that should be scary, um, you know. And it's, it's something that we need to, to fight on because, you know, especially now that that you know technology is um, is is neutral, right? Technology has no motivation. Technology is only motivated by the people that are controlling it. And so, especially now with everything being online, everything is is in cloud storage. If if we don't fight back on this this amount of control, then then they literally can wipe away every record of, of you. Not not literally. It's not me saying that there'll be no record of you. But if you have no banking services, you know you have no email, you have no YouTube to go and make the whatever content you want. Then um, you know you're you're essentially personless. You become it's, excluded from society. Yeah, definitely. One thing that like it's one thing that annoys me is you see sometimes um, in the cities mostly. Uh, these businesses that that really really pride themselves on being cashless and i mean sure cash can be frustrating to carry around nobody really likes a you know pile of coins in their pocket but that being said to me a cashless business means homeless people not welcome and so that's that's just a a way that you can be exuded from from society in that way one of the things that i've thought about with with the censorship regimes is that people people talk about google in this case, we're talking about payment processors, talk about social media companies, and they they blame the, the, the media companies and and the, the, the corporations. But the real reason why, especially in, in social media, this censorship now has, has kicked up and is really being pushed, it it really has come from the politicians and from, from Congress. I mean, Congress and the Democrats frankly, leading it, um, pulled the heads of these social media companies, you know, into congressional hearings and threatened them with regulation, with essentially like, like breaking up their companies if they didn't do something about, quote, you know, disinformation, misinformation online. Um, these media companies really don't want to be doing that. It's really, you know, they, they would rather just, you know, sit there and run the ads and take in the money and, 
they'll get pressure from advertisers for things to be ad friendly and they'll they'll respond to that but they, they don't want to be um they don't want to be talking about um disinformation and censoring and taking people off um but they're they've been forced to you know buy the politicians <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, question the money, and it all gets down to those motivations and um, and controlling a narrative and propaganda. Yeah, which of course, all of those people in, in Congress, all those politicians, uh, they are egotistical. They want control. It's the, that that sort of, of element uh, gets gets into this type of people that want to be above and be those people that are in control of saying what is and what is not verboten. So. One of the things with censorship I think of is is it's really almost like a feudal mindset where you have, you know, the elite lords, you know, treating people like peasants, like like children and, you know, deciding what is acceptable and not acceptable. Parental control. <laughs> and you know, and they work to divide us and you get people from, you know, one side of the of the political divide and they're accepting it because they, they think of it as going after the other guys. That, that's a big thing right now with with lefties and liberals. Um, and they, they see censorship as as going after the Trumpers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you gotta you gotta watch out and you gotta deal with those dangerous Trumpers, you know, the the other guys. And they, they just see it as a weapon to be used that way. And it's like it's like their, their thinking stops there because, you know, MSNBC is not telling them that <laughs> that it's it's a, it's something that's going to come back onto them. Right. I, um, the other thing it, it makes me think of is 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 um, what's called the, the Overton window, which I think a lot of people have, have heard of it at this point. But we'll 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 talk about like the, um, you know, what it is. It's um, you know we can go to to the, the Wikipedia article which which actually just makes you think of, of an aside of you know there there are serious problems these days with with Wikipedia and that it it it's still a go to source I mean you kind of you kind of can't function without it really for you know it, it's where you go to look up things but. But there are ways that it, it's it's manipulated. I mean, you you have um, government associated actors who are out there, you know, doing edits. Um, you know, people um, that you you just know are being coordinated and paid to do edits. I mean, I, you can hire a PR firm, and part of what they'll do if you're a famous person is manage your your PR presence and your Wikipedia presence, and they'll get in there and there'll people you know doing edits and they'll try to you know push it as much as you can and if you think that that you know government and narrative managers aren't aren't doing that then i think you're kind of naive <laughs> yeah definitely you just have to think about the motivations of the people that might be editing the information you're reading and and one of the examples of that is you know one of our favorite sites is the, the gray zone and, um, you know, I recommend everyone, you know, read The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, um, Aaron Mate, and the whole crew there. Um, they've had some recent stuff from, from Christian Parente that's been, you know, really good. And, you know, really, highly recommend, you know, in, in there, you know, they are anti-imperialist uh, from an anti-imperialist left, left viewpoint. But they are journalism. They are, you know, a very valid news source. If anyone has an example of something false being published on the gray zone that had to be retracted or that should be retracted, I would defy them to let us know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That is. And, and media that, that are outside of the of the main kind of, you know, what are the, the big eight that kind of almost the media companies uh, outside of that, that window, that Overton window of acceptability, uh, it gets gets suppressed by search engines uh, and, and depreciated. And, and yeah, I mean, it's it's that's that's traumatic. And so where this connects on to uh, Wikipedia is that on Wikipedia, the, the gray zone is what they call a deprecated news source. And if you, if you, I believe if you try to link, use it as a reference, if you're doing a Wikipedia article or editing one, um, they will either disallow it or push back on that, Hmm. you know, and it's not a a trusted, you know, legacy news source. I mean, that is a thing that the, the gray zone guys have talked about. Interesting. But 
here we are still at Wikipedia, because what are we going to do? Are we going to go to the other Wikipedia? Yeah, same for YouTube. I mean, if you need to find a little how-to video, you look on YouTube. If you need to look up some concept, you look on Wikipedia. Yeah. So the Overton window is, is this, this concept of, of the things that are allowed to be talked about in mainstream, in, in corporate media, you know, the mainstream sources. And, and kind of the idea is you, you set kind of this left limit and the right limit. And so the, the, left, the left limit might be something like um, Bernie Sanders talking about socialism. Yeah. And that's considered like the, the left that we, and if you're going further than that, if you're talking about communism or communal ownership of property and things like that, no, that's, that's crazy talk. And on the right wing side, although it keeps getting pushed more and more right, it seems like, um, you know, you would have things like, censorship being normalized i would say but you know you have a right-wing concept of things like restricting immigration or you know all the, the you know the right-wing kind of things but going real right-wing into you know fascistic or white supremacist type of talk that's outside um but the other part of it and this is something that you know there's a noam chomsky quote about this about what happens in the middle of the window that used to be on this Wikipedia page, and uh, it's it's no longer there. I had, uh, I had luckily kind of copied and, and pasted it out of the pasted it out at one point, um, and the uh, what used to be there <laughs> was um, in 1998. Noam Chomsky said um, about the about the Overton window and and what happens within it. He says that the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum, even encourage the more critical and dissonant views within the spectrum. That gives people the sense that there's free thinking going on, while all the time the presuppositions of the system are being reinforced by the limits imposed on the range of the debate. So within that range, you, you let people argue and, you know, people, uh, but outside of that range, the discussions don't happen. And apparently this Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky quote was outside of that range because now it's gone from the Wikipedia page on Overton Window where it seemed to fit quite well. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're allowed to, to argue till the day's end about critical race theory, and you're not allowed to talk about whether we should be spending all the money that can feed our citizens on war. Mm -hmm. And speaking of an anti-war and, and um, anti-imperialist voice out there, one of our favorites is uh, Caitlin Johnstone. And um, you know, I really, I really can't recommend you know her enough. Everyone should be subscribed to her newsletter and should be reading you know what she puts out there. Um, not so long ago, we had a Russell Brand reading from her article, which was uh, which was pretty cool. And just as an aside, I mean, Russell Brand is, there's something happening there. I mean, he's he's getting millions and millions of views. A lot and, of people. And he's talking about um, anti-imperial subjects. He's you know, reading Caitlin Johnstone. He's talking about um, censorship as being terrible. You know, there's, it's something going on there. Yeah, it's 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 nice to see, and uh, you know, like you said, somebody of his caliber has just that much of an audience, and uh, and, and is in some in some ways, you know, un not not uncensorable, but but unlikely to be, and so that's interesting to see uh, what'll lead from that. So for Caitlin, let's show a bit of Caitlin. Um, we've got here's an article from earlier in the year. You know, let's back up a sec and ask why free speech actually matters. And with Caitlin articles, you can also, there's also audio versions of them, which um, has um, her husband, Tim, reading from it. And so he does a really good read of the articles and, and they do a real collaboration of them. But you can't go too wrong, like just reading from Caitlin and um, we'll, uh, we'll do like the cheat. We'll, we'll go to the end, <laughs> reading the last chapter of the book. Um, but she finishes this one with, uh, so it becomes clear that the only thing to do is to let everyone speak on the platforms that people have come to rely on for sharing ideas and information with the largest possible number of people. A great many of them will be wrong, 
A great many of them will be stupid, but the alternative is shutting down the possibility of healthy change ever occurring in a status quo that is killing our ecosystem, pushing us towards confrontations with nuclear armed nations, and becoming increasingly despotic. And she was talking about these confrontations in um, back in January. Based Caitlin. So when we're talking about talking about censorship then you get into the question of you know what do we do about it what do we do about this mess i mean one one of the first things and that gets into caitlin and, and and russell brand is um to be educating people about it you know that's that's huge i mean that's it's definitely a huge step one that that has to happen it's crucial and caitlin johnson talks about an awakening um a societal awakening um in general, of just more and more people cluing in, and perhaps hitting this this tipping point of of you just get so many people who, who get it that that there's this propaganda going on that the censorship is is holding up, and it has to change. It, it's just not acceptable. So that's you know a, a step one. We need to be demanding you know freedom of expression, freedom of speech. In having protests about it, direct actions about it, strikes about it, we need to be demanding it. Another thing we can be working on is is moving to to more decentralized platforms. Um, one of the issues you get with with a YouTube or, or a Twitter is that it's just this this central platform that that just has this very small number of people running it and they can just decide to cut you off. It is possible through technology, through mesh networks, through um, distributed um, serving platforms to to do it in a way that it, it really can't be cut off. Um, and it really becomes, you know, like, like the way Bitcoin works, this is the way um, uh, BitTorrent works, peer-to-peer networks. You know, it, it's possible to be to be doing those things in in, the, in that way, and it's things we should be investigating and, and working on. Right. Um, there's also uh, the idea of, of nationalizing um, these platforms, like, like a YouTube, like um, like uh, like a Twitter, and so forth. And you know, we, we can make the decision as a society that these things are just too important. To be, um, uh, to be just corporate for-profit entities, and you can not only nationalize them, but you you could nationalize them and then reorganize them along worker-owned, worker co-op style models. You could say every every employee gets an equal vote yep. when major decisions happen on leadership, on policy. Um, you could even have a um, a type of voting stake for the users. You could have votes on things. Um, it's perfectly possible to do these things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's a, that's the, the model that Wikipedia should be in. And so you're going to be all, especially because something like that mm. becomes like a common conscience. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, the co-op model is incredibly uh, um, helpful. It can be like the hive brain. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, yeah, that's what it should be. The other thing you can do as far as the rules and regulations around something like a YouTube is, is there's the concept of a common carrier. This is something that uh, Matt Stoller talks about a lot on his writings. And the idea is that you, you treat it more like, like you, you do the phone company. Like in that if, if you use your phone to, to plan a crime and, or even commit a crime, you don't, you don't like the phone company doesn't cut off your phone service. It's like, it's it's just considered a service, a thing that you have a right to, and if you do something illegal on on the service, then that should be a law enforcement matter. That should be a, you know a government police enforcement matter if if that's what it comes down to, right? And if it does come down to that, then you have a due process. You you might you know go all the way to a trial, or, you know trial by jury. And if you get convicted, then we you know have processes and laws and appeals. And if it doesn't rise to that level, then it's speech. It's, you know, it's speech. It shouldn't be censored. It should be allowed. At the very least, if you're going to get into things with terms of service, you should have, you know, very clear processes, you know, in a form of due process there that's transparent, that's equitable. These are the things that, you know, that we really need to be demanding. Yeah, so definitely I'm um, getting into some of the 
uh, parallels between censorship and crime. And of course, uh, when you're dealing with the government and, and crime, one of the big connections that can happen there is the fact that people that, that are attracted to power, uh, it's almost kind of like this criminal mind sort of set. Like one of the things that I always uh, mm-hmm. thought was interesting is because, you know, in, in my work, I've, I've worked in correctional facilities doing, doing various things. And, um, one of the things I've noticed is, is if you look at the, the criminal and the police, they're, they're essentially the same kind of person. You know, that, that's that's why somebody becomes a police officer is because they're attracted to crime. They're attracted to these things because, you know, it's the it's, it's same kind of brain. So the same thing with people in politics is is they're attracted to that power. They're attracted to that ability of, of feeling like they're above the law. And so well, it, it makes me think of like the Bulger brothers here. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> in Massachusetts, you had one guy who was the, the speaker of the state legislature. Yep. Uh, uh, Billy Bulger, Billy Bulger yeah. and then you had Whitey Bulger, the notorious, notorious uh, crime me- boss, yeah. mafia gangster. <laughs> yeah, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, and so uh, what you're going to get too is is people that are dealing in, in the in the business of cover ups, and the cover up is, is essentially its its own form of, of like uh, evolved censorship. You know, it's 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 not only censorship, but it's also a creative story to cover up any sort of censorship or any bad doing that that journalist or whistleblower was was going to be talking about. So yeah, on that uh, topic of, of cover-ups, I wanted to bring up a, a story. This is uh, as a man, Adrian Schoolcraft. Uh, just a little bit of background on him. So he's a police officer in the uh, 2000s. He uh, was definitely a uh, very like patriotic and by, by all amounts a good guy. He joined the NYPD shortly after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, basically feeling a patriotic drive. He went through the police academy, became a police officer, was assigned to a precinct, and worked in patrol for many years. Uh, he was later, after what we were going to talk about happened to him, went down, he, he expressed that as a police officer, he uh, felt that you know he took his job very seriously. He was very serious in, in this kind of sense of personal justice. So yeah, in the, um, in the 90s, uh, following off of the, the 80s and the kind of uh, you know, crime wave that you might describe that New York was having in the 70s and 80s, you had a big push into this system called CompStat. So CompStat, which is still being used today uh, in New York, is a crime uh, measure tracking system. So basically it's the, that are- uh, They're tracking. trying to put these t- statistical models yeah. to, the, to law enforcement. Right. And so it's the NYPD year by year tracking crime. And so similar to how corporations, they're always wanting to see a profit margin and they will do anything within that quarter to get that profit margin just a they little have bit a better. better quarter, yeah. And it has to be better every single quarter. The same concept happened with the NYPD and CompStat. There was a, a drastic pressure on the brass and the police department, the commanding officers, that every single year those CompStat numbers had to be going down and the arrests and enforcement had to be going up to look like the NYPD was doing a really, really good job at keeping crime down and keeping, um, you know, criminals locked up. And so what happened to, what, what started to happen is people, um, after just witnessing the NYPD and how they do operations, became suspicious that there were quotas going on. Uh, quotas being that commanding officers were telling the rank and file officers on the streets that you need to be going out and making a certain amount of arrests. So uh, Adrian Schoolcraft basically found that that was what was happening. And so he, with his feeling that as a police officer, it was his duty not only to police the public, but to police the police, decided to start to put a wire on himself, put a, put a recording system under his uniform, and he started uh, recording, and, and he got a lot of recordings of police officers, police commanders, actually going in and telling these officers, like, yeah, you need to make this amount of, of, of speeding tickets today, this amount of that, this amount of crimes. And they would berate them. Right. And uh, at, at some point, uh, Schoolcraft was was, was uh, figured out. Uh, there's actually lots of... of um, videos of, of you know police commanders sitting down and talking to them and very much that um, in law enforcement you call the blue wall of silence that that's the thing that basically when it comes to accusing other police officers or if a police officer sees a police officer do some, another police officer do something improper you don't talk and so they started giving him really um, bad assignments you know putting putting him on weird hours trying to encourage him to not do this thing uh, until at, at one point uh, essentially, he was in a fight with with a sergeant. He was like, "Oh, I'm gonna go home sick." 
He goes home sick, and this is all recorded. The police department comes to his home. Uh, they they force their way in, and basically tell tell Adrian that he told that his uh, his police commander that he was going to harm himself, and they uh, said so that he was an emotionally disturbed person. That's e- what they claimed. Yeah, and EDP EDP is a term that that NYPD uses some police departments for emotionally disturbed person. And so essentially, what they do is they they take him and they relieve him of his duty. He's suspended as a police officer, and he was placed in a mental health facility. Not only is he basically arbitrarily jailed, uh, but but basically just just held away. As a matter of fact, the only reason why we even even know that that he came out of this facility is his father, who hadn't heard from him. His father lived in upstate New York, hadn't heard from Adrian in in, in a while, in, in weeks and months, and uh, started calling around hospitals. And after after being able to, to call enough of those, he found out where his son was. They got him out. Uh, recently, Adrian actually uh, won an almost million-dollar award from the city for false imprisonment. Uh, he no longer works as a police officer and, and actually um, has never really re- never really recovered his life in the same way. I believe he's still uh, he's living with his father in upstate New York and, and has some issues, you know, surrounding what happened to him. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good That's example so- of when somebody who is inside that power – uh, starts to speak out against that power, how they will be erased, and any they will be shunned down, othered, and basically their their voice will be censored and, and covered or disappeared up and, and disappeared. Yes, and it makes me think of Assange. Yeah, I and mean, that's you know what what they do to whistleblowers. Definitely. Speaking of NYPD, we had a um, a case uh, pretty recently about NYPD secretly collecting. The, the DNA from thousands of New Yorkers. And, you know, this was just a thing they were doing. Yes. <laughs> and it, it reminds me of, it's kind of a cliche in some of the, the movies of how they'll um, give the bad guy a cup of coffee or a cigarette. And then afterwards they, they get the DNA off of it. And, you know, you see that in a movie and you think that's, you know, a bit much. Well, I mean, they were, they were really doing it <laughs> and they were keeping this, this, this database. I'm just putting it into the database and using the database. And this is why it's, you know, transparency is so important. Regulation is so important. And whistleblowers are hugely important because they're, you know, they're a big part of that. The story that, um, that's been around there recently that I also wanted to hit was this supposed kidnap plot against um, the Michigan governor, uh, Whitmer. Just about at the time we're recording this, the jury came in on that and, and there were four guys that were being accused and uh, two of them were acquitted and it was a hung jury for the other two. And this was supposed to be a big highlighted huge case against the dangerous, scary white supremacist faction out there. And, you know, and, and what you had in this case was really similar to what you saw after 9-11 of where, you know, there's frankly not really much happening out there as far as, you know, Muslims in, in, in the U S planning attacks and whatnot. So the FBI and Homeland Security need to justify their, those budgets and keep those budgets increasing. So they would infiltrate these groups and their, their infiltrators don't just go in and listen, but they go in and encourage the plots and sometimes they even bring in money. And, it, and, and it's clear that's what, what happened in this case. And that's why they, they couldn't get a conviction what was supposed to be supposed to be an easy case because they basically find these guys that are frankly kind of doofuses that are easily led when you rile them up and you say we're gonna you know do this thing in this plot and you know maybe these are guys who who should have maybe had some kind of enforcement but this idea that basically none of this happens if the fbi and the and their guys aren't in there planning it and making it happen where this kind of ties into censorship is you have you had a spokesman for for Whitmer, the governor, coming out with this wonderful quote. The plot to kidnap and kill a governor may seem like an anomaly, but we must be honest about what it really is. The result of violent, divisive rhetoric that is all too common across our country. There must be accountability and consequences for those who commit heinous crimes. Without accountability, extremists will be emboldened. And you just have the, you know, the real focus in there on, on rhetoric. You know, we have this violent, divisive rhetoric. And so what are we got to do about it? Well, of course, you have to censor. You know, that's really kind of what I took away from there as, as the real connection in this whole thing. So I think we'll kind of 
kind of come close to wrapping on on that one but you know again i would bring it back once again to where we should begin hitting the beginning in the middle and the end you know and julian assange that you know assange needs to be free we need his voice back we need to not be censoring and crushing whistleblowers yeah everybody should be allowed to to express their voice and furthermore is that we should be getting our information from not only uh, corporate interests but we should be getting information from the wide the wide source of interest and we should be uh, constantly uh, critical of, of what we hear and constantly wondering about the motivations and the money behind what we hear free assange free assange and the other thing i'll finish with is if you want to uh, well, first thing is, is if you like what you're seeing here, like and, and subscribe on, on the old YouTube or wherever you're seeing this. If you want to see uh, some of what I'm up to, you can uh, hit my website, which is at uh, erictred.com. And you can see what I put out there as a proposed list of demands. I'm calling uh, 11 demands for real democracy. And connecting on to today's show is one of the core demands is to reject censorship, protect freedom of speech. Uh, break up and nationalize you know the large corporations reorganize them as employee owned and governed hit carrier common carrier style rules disallow deletions and deplatforming except via a due process that is transparent fair and democratic which is one of the things i really like to hit on you know we need more real democracy and um, and the algorithms need to be regulated they need to be transparent and open to public scrutiny definitely so I think we'll leave it there. Yeah. As always, free Assange. And keep keep questioning, keep challenging authority, and uh, talk to your friends, talk to your family, you know, open up conversations about these topics, and, um, you know, we'll see what we can do as, as a people. And that will say crime and politics over and out. Over and out. I was I, I I was I was full of piss and vinegar at ten. <laughs> <laughs>